Virya is a Pali word, and the translations in English usually effort or trying to, to try hard. And the literal meaning of Virya is very interesting. It's made up of the word Vira plus Irya. That makes Virya. And Vira is a word for hero, a brave person, a courageous one. And the word Virya means what a brave person does or their, their acts, their task. In the world, when there's fighting going on between one side and another, there are heroes who emerge uh, at the time of this fighting. Heroes are needed, and so too, when one battles the inner enemies within one's being, the enemy called kilesas. When one battles these, to the extent one's virya is good, one can be called a hero. So, worse than the outer enemies that take the form of beings, the inner enemies are far worse because the outer enemies we only meet them occasionally and we can see them from afar and they can only kill us once. But the inner enemies cause us to lose our virtue, to lose our morality, to lose our reputation, our dignity, and cause us to lose our life time and again. So one has to have courage when facing the inner enemy. One can't have any regard for life or limb. And such a person is called Vera, a hero. And what, what the hero does is called Virya. The Bud, Buddha used a word, a synonym, for virya, which is osaha. And this quality is described as when one uh, one encounters something, some difficulty, when one is engaged in work that is pure and clean and to one's own benefit, one encounters mental and physical difficulties, mental and physical suffering, especially physical. And when one encounters this type of difficulty, those who can't face that, those who can't, um, who can't stand up in the face of difficulty, the word for that is lena. It means that one just wants to be comfortable in that situation. They, one doesn't want to go forward. One is not able to advance if, uh, in that situation if one has this quality of lena. So when we are working for our own true benefit, we can't just try to be comfortable. We can't just take it easy. We have to make sacrifices and we have to work wholeheartedly. So in that case, we, ha we, uh, we encounter, we have to endure the mental and physical difficulties that arise in the case of doing this task. And for one who can reflect, you know, reflect well about this, then then one is intimate with virya. When dukkha arises, one, ha there, one, night, one needs to be able to endure it when suffering arises, to endure and be patient. And this quality becomes apparent when one is doing this pure and clean work. 
So one understands that um, a courageous person is one who endures difficulty. When one sees, when one see, when we see someone who's engaged in pure and clean work, and despite encountering difficulties, continues in doing that work, continues applying an effort in, in making this effort, that type of person is called heroic. That type of person is recognized as heroic because of this, um, what they do. And when one applies effort and overcomes the difficulty, then joy arises, piti, there's satisfaction. Here in the practice, one has to work wholeheartedly. One has to sacrifice. One can't just expect to be comfortable. It's good uh, to... Some countries of the world are very advanced technologically. And in such countries, people no longer rely on their own physical strength and mental strength even to, um, to do things. So what happens is that people's capacity to apply energy, to apply their own individual effort, weakens because of this. So when one has, to, when we're in a situation where an effort needs to be applied, then um, those who aren't used to making effort in their lives, when they get a little bit tired, they don't want to do anymore. So although it is good to be advanced technologically, but what happens is that one's, one's own individual capabilities can become weakened. When we are doing the work that can make us truly human with human mentality and better than average human knowledge, this is work that only can be done by our own effort. And when we are engaged in this to the extent that uh, there is courage uh, one also must also be able to endure. So with courage, there's, while doing courageous work, one has to endure. And this ability to endure, this endurance, patience, is called osaha in Pali. Everyone has the duty to develop the ability that will that is sure to that is sure to bring to oneself one's own civilization. It brings to oneself uh, one's own uh, civilized behavior. And in doing so, one also contributes to helping the world. So everyone has a duty to develop this ability. And if one is engaged in this type of work, then it's sure that one is going to meet up with difficulties. So one, should, one needs to nurture this courageous mind, the courageous attitude that says, when I meet up with a difficulty, I'm going to face it. So that, that the courage of a hero must be nurtured. And... When I meet with suffering, I'll bear it. I'll endure it. To do this is not worthless. It is valuable. When one meets up with an, an obstacle and overcomes it, one becomes very satisfied. And to the extent that one knows that this determined courage is beneficial one works to make it more and more. And this is called danla virya in Pali. This danla means firm, and virya means courage. So this virya has momentum, it has power, and it translates, I think, best as determined effort. 
So to get to this place, to get to this point, what do yogis need to do? Today, Sayadaji will explain this. The nature of virya is that it has three levels. The first is called arambha datu. That means the initial effort that we make, the, st- the starting effort. Second is nekama datu. That means increasing our effort a notch so as to overcome laziness. And third is parekama datu. That means the effort that advances stage by stage until one reaches one's goal. Humans should have a goal. Whether it's in getting an education or in getting things, making a living, or for our health, we may have a goal that we want to reach, or some people have goals in social ways, And especially, one should have the goal to become a true human being with a humane, humane heart, humane knowledge, humane mentality, and with knowledge that is special human knowledge. This type of goal is even more needed. It shouldn't be just an experiment. This uh, becoming a true human with a humane heart and better than average human knowledge, without fail, it should be a goal of ours. Sometimes people gain an education, but they may not be moral, or they may, um, they may, after getting their education, get work. They may strive in immoral ways to better themselves. So although one succeeds in many ways, if one does not have true human behavior, if one does, is immoral, then this is not good. On the other hand, one who masters oneself is the highest, and one should value this. When one cherishes and values the benefits of satipatthana and comes to practice, then one makes a start, but one hasn't gotten the benefits yet. One just knows from a theoretical standpoint, purity of mind is the benefit that comes from the practice. And this purity of mind uh, in doing this practice one becomes a true human with a human mentality and this special knowledge which makes us uh, an above an outstanding human being and we know that to do this we follow this path so in in order to do this we need to approach a good friend a kalyana mita a good spiritual friend who can teach combining the theory with the practice. And having approached, one has to simply observe every arising object, always um, always guard the mind with vigilant mindfulness. And the things that are, arise are physical, kaya, their feelings, good or bad, neutral, and various kinds of consciousness and other types of objects. So there are these many fields, large fields of observation. And within the large field of observation, there are small individual objects arising. So one has to begin to make effort to observe But one can't follow all these arising objects at once. So when we sit, we put our mind on the abdomen, and when the abdomen arises, we apply effort. We have to get the mind there to where the rising happens. 
and when the falling happens, then also we have to make effort to get the mind there. So this is making initial effort. And it's the same with, uh, you know, until we gain experience, we just keep on having, having to apply our mind to get it there. And it's the same with every step we take. We have to put our mind on the leg every time we make a step. We have to make this effort. And lifting and placing, too. Every time we lift the foot, every time we place it, we have to make effort to get the mind there. Lifting, moving, placing, to know the nature that is there. We have to apply, always apply this initial effort. So we make a start in trying. But because we don't have skill yet, most of the time we miss. But that's natural. So we just have to tell ourselves, this is the way it is. We just have to try to do what we can. And so we keep on trying. And our, our virya becomes good by doing this. So this is our initial effort. And our effort grows. But at the start, we haven't seen the benefits yet. So sometimes doubt enters our mind. But the Buddha said, this is the way to purification of mind. And there's no two ways. This is the one way to this purification of mind. In our initial work, so we, sorry, we keep on building our effort and to the extent that we gain, uh, gain momentum, then the dense laziness is reduced. At the start, if the momentum of our virya is not yet good, then thinking can come in and we can get depressed. One thinks, I'm trying, nothing's happening. And uh, another thing that can happen is we start to imagine what, what is going to happen. We think about the future. And then our effort drops. And one becomes uh, unable to go forward. One gets afraid. So one has to have this stepped-up effort. One needs to boost our effort a notch when this happens. And this is called nekama datu. So the mind has to not, can't back off. And also, we can't have this consideration for what can happen to our body, what can happen to our life if we make effort. So we have to just boost our energy and advance to meet the enemy. When we meet the enemy, when we encounter an enemy, if we retreat, the enemy will go after us. So we can't let that happen. We have to face the enemy. So if we are scared, then the enemy will get the advantage. So when laziness enters our mind, and uh, we, we stop trying, then one gets careless. And one thinks, this isn't beneficial. Practicing is not beneficial. And then one decides, okay, I'm just going to go home. I'll leave the retreat. So in order to get over this type of laziness, this laziness, then just boost your effort. And this is called nekamadatu taking your net effort up a notch, up a level, in order to get over laziness. This is something that yogis encounter. The Buddha gave a guarantee. Satanang visudhya ekayana mago. 
satanang visudya. So this means the the purification of beings, that is, the purification mentally of beings. This is the sure way to achieve this purification. The sure way is steadfast observation of the four kinds of objects, kaya, vedana, citta, dhamma, matter, feeling, consciousness, and dhammas. If one translates this as this ekaya no mego as the one and only way, the one way, Westerners tend not to like this. However, this is what was said over 2,500 years ago by the Buddha. If we include this, then sometimes people even get up and leave the retreat. This is the sure way to mental purity. And it ends the violence that occurs, the transgression that occurs because of mental defilement. If one transgresses, this is like picking up feces and becoming dirty with it. So there's mental dirt, the defilements that arise in the mind, and then there's actions that occur as a result of this mental defilement. To clean this, to purify this, just consider how good this benefit is. We are practicing to get this benefit. And when one applies effort to observe the arising object stage by stage and comes to develop knowledge, when one's, uh, when one's effort becomes strong enough, then, sorry, when one's mind becomes clean enough, then one starts to see. One discerns, the, distinguish, distinguishes between nama and rupa, mind and matter. One sees how mind and matter are related as cause and effect. And one sees how this mind and matter, which are related as cause and effect, are not permanent. They are unsatisfactory. This is the start of Vipassana knowledge. So this, when our mind is clean, this is the knowledge that we can develop. And if one continues from that point, then one comes to see the, the very fast, fleeting, arising and passing away of phenomena how the old is continually being replaced by the new, one after another. So if one reaches this stage, then one won't back up because one's effort, this is the stage where virya has become, uh, has gone up another level. And it has reached the stage where it advances stage by stage until one reaches the goal. So this, this is the third stage of effort. Whether we're working to get an education or when, whether we're working to make a living, there are always these three levels of virya involved. And in this work of becoming a true human with a humane heart, humane mentality, and special human knowledge, these three levels of virya are even more important. If one reaches this stage, then parakamadhatu is just going along with its own momentum every second of the time. This is developed virya, arada virya. This is where the first and second stages are the initial effort, and the boosted up effort, these effort, types of effort have gained momentum. And so this type of effort is called pagaha virya. This is, pagaha means that it's uplifting. It doesn't stagnate. It always goes up, up and up. And it doesn't drop down. It keeps on going up until it reaches the max. And the final stage of effort is when effort becomes fulfilled. 
and this is called Paripuna Virya. So at this stage, the type of energy that is being applied is called the, uh, the four kinds of supreme, in some places it's called supreme effort, samapadanas. These four types of effort are, are first of all, the energy to prevent unwholesomeness that has not yet arisen. The energy to prevent the unwholesome akusala that has not yet arisen. And then if akusala has arisen, one makes the effort so that something like this doesn't happen again. That's the second type of supreme effort. And the third facet of this is to the energy to create, to generate the wholesomeness that has not yet arisen. And the fourth aspect is to increase, to develop, to, to make it happen more and more, the wholesomeness or kusala that has already arisen. So this is um, how this is how our effort works. It becomes it. It is uplifting until it reaches fulfillment. So these are the four things called four, the four samapadana, the four types of supreme effort. One makes effort to... Um, sorry, I skipped something. So one makes the kusala that is already arising, tries to make it better and better. So these four samapadanas are exactly the same as virya sambojanga. When someone has good intelligence and they make effort, and they're respectful, meticulous, and work without taking breaks, within one week they can reach this stage. If one is intelligent and making effort and hasn't reached this stage within one week, then there's something missing, such as not respectful work, not working meticulously, not working continuously. For some yogis, they practiced different methods before and they are attached to these methods. So for some yogis who are in that situation, they say things like, everything is really clear. I know everything that is happening. But if you ask them, okay, what do you know? They cannot reply. This shows that what they, uh, that this is just their imagination when they cannot reply what it is that they know. This is their, just their thinking. So the yogis that Siyaraji is speaking about have been practicing for more than a month now. And if one doesn't know, uh, in this practice where one has to observe the arising object with effort and accurate aim, if one doesn't know about the objects one is observing, this is like swallowing a lump of food without chewing it. So we have to chew the food that is in our mouth. And when we chew the food, the taste comes out of the food and we know the taste. So in practice too, in the objects, in the things that arise in our being, there are many types of true nature to be found. In the earth element, patavidantu, it has the nature of being hard, soft, coarse, refined. Apodatu, the water element, it has the nature to be flowing, solid, sticky. The element of temperature, tejodatu, has the nature to be hot, warm, cold, also light, lightness. And the, um, the air element, vayodatu, has the true nature of being stiff 
or tight or tense. So the mind, too, it has the nature to know. Pasa, the, the quality of contact, has the nature to touch. Vedana, or feeling, has the nature to feel. So these are all like flavors that can be found in food. They are really there. So another word for these is sarasa. Sabhava is the, the first word, natural, natural characteristic, and they are also called sarasa, the individual flavor of the, the dhamma, which is really there. So if one observes the rising and doesn't know anything, doesn't know anything about it, if one observes the falling and doesn't know anything, if one observes lifting, moving, placing, and doesn't know what is happening in the lifting, doesn't experience any of the flavors, lifting, moving, and placing, then this is like not paying attention to the food when one is eating. So, if one makes the effort to observe, to, to apply accurate aim, and to apply effort to observe, then every time one observes the arising object in this way, one will know. And when one knows, one will be able to say what it is that one knew. So yogis who are not able to say anything when they are asked what do they know about the rising, what do they know about the falling, or whatever object they observed, the yogis who say the same thing every day, what these yogis need to do is just to try to apply effort according to the instructions to observe the arising object with art and effort and accurate aim. If what the yogi, then, then the yogis are guaranteed to, if they follow the instructions, this method is guaranteed. If what the yogi does is something different than the instructions, then there's no way we can guarantee. So Sayadawji asks, please use the gift that he is giving you. A gift is given so that you will use it. And if you use it, then the one who gives it will be happy and it will be worthwhile to have given this gift. <laughs> 